Our new resource strategy will call for no new large traditional central station plants to be built within the next eight to 10 years. After that, I will say very clearly, if there is no better alternative, we will have to return to the, to the traditional baseload facilities. But by the end of the decade, our new system resource strategy, including economy off system purchases and increased conservation and load management, is projected to reduce capital costs by over $2 billion from what large central station plant capacity would have cost. Now let me interpret that for you. In the days when we were building on the old format, all utilities probably had an embedded debt of from 4 to 6 percent. They were selling at above book value on their common stock, and they were probably paying at that time about 8 percent for mortgage bonds. Now most of us have an, an embedded cost of debt in excess of 10 percent. Only a few of us, a few more now than recently, have our common stock selling above book value. And we're still paying somewhere in the order of 12 to 15 percent for mortgage bonds. This is the big difference, and this, this is why cost is so important in the contemplation of continuing large central station format for system resource additions. Also, we expect what we have been doing in the new and alternates to displace the energy equivalent of nearly 50 million barrels of expensive gas and oil. In addition, air emissions into the environment will be reduced by over 50 tons per day from amounts emitted by the burning of fossil fuels. And in the part of the world where the word smog was first coined, that is important. Our goal is to develop 2,190 megawatts of firm generation from renewable and alternate resources by 1994. This is over 40% of our new generation requirements for the next 10 years. The other 60% is represented by construction already in progress, including the nuclear plants that I referred to that are just now going in service. All of this capacity that is not new and alternate is now under construction or it is about to go in service. With the advent of the PURPA laws and the involvement of independent developers in the energy supply business, we found that there was an opportunity to help us meet this goal. The PURPA laws aren't what we would have written. We would have liked to have had the privilege of having a lot of those advantages as a utility that the independent developer has. But that wasn't the real world. We didn't have it. So we decided that we would negotiate the best contracts that we could with these independent developers under, under the PURPA laws. And this we have done. Now the combination of all this effort is that presently we are ahead of schedule with about 60% of our 10-year goal and we announced our policy in October of 1980. But we have 60% of our goal, or over 1,300 megawatts, either online, under construction, or represented by signed contracts or letters of intent. Our own plans include large cogeneration projects and commercial wind ventures. In some cases, as partners with other private enterprises, sharing the financial costs and the risks and the benefits, but in others where we would indeed be able to do some of, our, some of it ourselves. The, these activities could presage a new role for the utility. It isn't so many years ago that we disdained to be in partnerships whereby we didn't completely control the facility 
And we also disdained the idea of not having enough capacity rolling on the system that would cover all of our needs. In the new world of operating efficiently, effectively, economically for the customer's benefit, we may and others may choose to do otherwise. And it doesn't disturb us a bit as long as we have the control of the dispatch of the resource. It doesn't disturb us at all if other people's money built it. At Edison, we use aggressive conservation and load management programs as well. And this complements our accelerated development of renewable and alternate resources. The value of conservation and load, and load management to our industry and the new business environment is rapidly becoming apparent. In fact, nearly three quarters of 120 major utilities in the United States have adopted formal conservation programs and two thirds are taking steps to limit demand for power on peak days. The utility's efforts to promote conservation and load growth control should avoid the need nationally to build some 30,000 megawatts of new capacity over the next 20 years, thus saving 45 billion in construction costs and retarding significantly by that reduction of construction costs the need for rate cases or rate increases. At Edison, load management is a, as vital to resource planning as central station power plants, hydroelectric projects, and PERPA resources. Without the benefits of load management, our projected demand through 1993 would grow at an annual rate of 2.4 percent, requiring the, the, uh, the addition of more than 6,400 megawatts. We're roughly about a 15 million kilowatt system as we're now resourced, peaking at between 13 and 14 million. But in any event, with the program that we have in effect, where we have conservation programs and load management programs, we expect to manage our load growth at 2%. And this will keep our new capacity needs at just over 5,000 megawatts for this period. Influencing customer power use and shaping the system demand curve is of value to every utility, but the target is determined by the utility resource situation. For Southern California Edison, marginal fuel costs and the financial and regulatory implications of adding new generating facilities have made conservation of capacity more feasible in new construction. Now thus far I have discussed trends that are currently perceived. Many of the solutions I have outlined are consistent with these trends. Specifically, new modular technologies reinforce the decentralization of electric power generation systems. Such technologies as modular coal plants, fuel cells, and renewables condense the traditional 10 to 20 year electric utility business cycle to five to 10 years. A major legislative, in the major legislative intent of PURPA was to open up comp competition, particularly through ownership of small power production facilities by third parties. The independent producers or entrepreneurial developers were the beneficiaries of the PURPA laws. Southern California Edison contributes to this increased competition by recognizing the PURPA laws and taking advantage of them, but also by having its engineering and construction department compete with outside contractors bidding on construction projects. We also own Mono Power Company, a resource development subsidiary, which has participated in many of the renewable and alternate resource programs and also handles such other potential fuel sources as tar sands, uh, oil shale, uh, exploration for oil and gas, and a ongoing nuclear fuel operation 
where we actually mine and mill uranium. There are other electric utility positions that are important in this perspective of the future. One is the financial posture. We used to say that, uh, that most of the world traded on utility company credit. We used to say that $1.11 was spent in the capital goods area on electric facilities. We still are a very large influence in the financial institutions and in the financial markets of the world. With the large potential that we, that we have as electric utilities for capital investment, we must make choices regarding the nature of our own future in such a way that our securities and our financial instruments are popular. My own company during the past four years has marketed roughly one half billion dollars in debt securities on the European continent. This has in all cases been at least 50 to 100 basis points below what we could have done domestically. This is another innovation that must be recognized, that must be examined in order to protect the interests of the customer and keep the rates at the lowest level possible. Now, in summary, in the last 10 years, there have been dramatic changes in the planning and resource developments in the utility business. And we at Edison are currently engaged in what we think is a new way of doing business. Further changes will be necessary to make the choices which will carry us confidently into the future. We, we must monitor and strategically evaluate the changing requirements. We must adopt a strategy of additional and diversified resources to contribute to our long-term resource mix. Recognizing that existing and conventional technologies, oil, gas, coal, and nuclear, are in themselves inadequate by themselves to meet future electric requirements, we must adopt a strategy of additional and diversified resources to contribute to our resource mix. We must recognize that choices of technologies for the 90s and beyond must be consistent with a changing role of electricity in the United States economy and must begin with commercialization accomplished now. Finally, and most importantly, our industry not only must improve on what it knows, but reach beyond its current knowledge, striving to identify solutions that may not yet have been considered. Electricity will remain essential to the U.S. economy and to national security. And despite many uncertainties, it appears that for utilities to be successful in the 1980s and beyond, they must adapt to a new operating environment through the pursuit of strategies that reduce the risks of new and costly plant construction and shift corporate resources away from traditional technologies toward cleaner, more efficient, generating technologies that are acceptable to the public. This winter meeting is a positive step for the future of our industry and our enterprise because it will help maintain open lines of communication among those in interested in energy resource development with a mutual recognition of our responsibilities and an un understanding of the practical roles, what is doable in the real world, we can work together in serving the customer as we have done for the past 100 years. Now, let me add just a footnote before I close. I've described something that among my colleagues in the industry wasn't popular. At the time that I announced the program for our company, one of my fellow CEOs in a meeting about two or three weeks later leaned across the table and said, what has the tooth fairy brought you lately? This was the general attitude of what had happened. I often think it was 
important to our enterprise as far as new and alternate resources were concerned, that they be initiated by a CEO who was an engineer and who had lived most of his life in the traditional engineering and construction environment of our business. But let me tell you what it brought to us. Remember, I announced it in 1980 in October. We're now going on almost four years being involved in it, and we're well ahead of schedule. At the time I announced it, I recognized that there were a great number of people in the Edison Company who trusted me and trusted my judgment. The day before I announced it, I wrote them a letter, which they received before the press were aware of what we were doing, which I told them what we were going to do, I told them why, I told them the, the, the importance of what we had done, the importance of the system we had built over a hundred years, and I told them the importance of their contribution. And I invited them in the last paragraph to join me in what I consider to be a journey that would be fraught with high adventure, but also fraught with opportunity. The results were fantastic. We had been beat about the ears. We had been punished by regulators, by environmentalists, by the public. Like many others in our industry, we hated to go to a social gathering because someone would complain about the rates, complain about the environment, complain about nuclear, complain about this, complain about that. All of a sudden, the organization started to stand tall. We were working on projects that could be completed. We were working on projects that, would be, that could be kept within budget, which, which, if you read the newspapers, is almost an unheard of thing in the eyes of the editorial writers for the utility business. But once again, we were within, we were within budget. We were on schedule. We were doing things. We were accepted in polite company. The organization started to stand tall, and it produced benefits that I didn't expect. The, the innovations in financing were a direct spin-off from the new attitude. There were innovations elsewhere. The net result was that our stock went from $24 to $42 at the beginning of this year. It's something like $39 right now. We are a nuclear utility. And whenever there's bad news in the nuclear business, every, every nuclear utility suffers a depression of its stock. So we, are, so we are about 39. From 24 to 39 isn't all that shabby. We came from less than book to well above book. And last year, these people in Southern California Edison Company who are standing tall turned in the best year that we've ever had in our history as far as operations are concerned. In the process of it, we won most of the recognitions that could come to, you, to a utility. We received the coveted Tyler Prize, the first corporation to ever be awarded the Tyler Prize for the protection of the environment, and things of this kind. So now when I meet my friend who says, what has the Tooth Fairy brought you lately? I say, do you really want to know? He says, no, I read about it. I know what the Tooth Fairy brought you. Now, if in presenting this new perspective that we have on resource planning, I have been less than modest, if I have been in any way preaching that this is the only way to do it, then I apologize. I'm humbly grateful we've had the success. It worked for us. It may not work for everyone. It may not work for more than this decade. But for this decade that is so troubled with nuclear plants littering the marshland like wounded ducks, where nuclear needs a success story, not rhetoric, we have provided some of those things. And in the eyes of this CEO, who was an engineer and who hopes to be considered an engineer still by his colleagues. I don't think it was all that shabby. Thank you for listening to me. I'm grateful to be among you. I'm humbly proud to be counted 
as your peers and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Our next speaker is Mr. T. Lewis Austin, Jr., uh, formerly Chairman and Chief Executive of Texas Utilities Company and now President and Chief Executive Officer of Brown and Root Corporation. Mr. Austin. I asked to change the schedule a little because uh, when you go from Chief Executive Officer of a holding company to the President of an operating company, it's quite a change. And I have an appointment at Halliburton offices at 4.30. That's my new boss, in case some of you out of towners don't know. Uh, I was up in Tennessee the other day, and well, first, Bill Gould, that was a good talk. And I'm glad that Tooth Fairy, Fairy was real kind to you. You've done a good job. He's a smart guy. I've been working with this guy, and so, and Pete, too, for a long time. One thing, I hate to leave the utility industry uh, because of all the great people in it. But I still, I've got a good little poor construction company that I'd like to work for all of you. <laughs> I heard this construction tale the other day. The guys went in up in East Tennessee at the lumber yard and they went in and said they want some four by twos. And uh, the lumber yard guy said, four by twos? Said, said, we got two by fours, but we haven't got four by twos. And they said, well, we want four by twos. And he said, well, I don't, we usually call them two by fours. So I said, wait a minute. So the two guys went out to this pickup truck, and he could see they're having a heated conversation and all, and finally they came back in and says, says uh, Charlie says two by fours be all right. And so he said, uh, okay, well, how long you want them? And they said, well, how long we want four by twos, two by fours, something. Well, how long you want them? I said, wait a minute. So they go out to the pickup truck, and there's more conversation out there, and they, they come back in and says, so Charlie says we want them pretty long. We're going to build a garage out of them. So <laughs> we're going to be in this... That wasn't a very good joke, was it? <laughs> the guy that told that told it good. It, it, it went over for him. <laughs> I guess that's the difference between a, 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 a tale teller and, a, and an engineer. But uh, what I'd like to talk about today is continuing on what Bill Gould just said about our dependence on, on Mideast oil and what we've got to do about it. And I titled this talk, in case anybody wanted to know about it, was, uh, was U.S. Energy, Strait of Hormuz, and Governance. And there's one scenario put out by the scientists and engineers for secure energy, that if somebody did block the Strait of Hormuz, we'd be in serious problems. And that we'd have emergency allocations from the government, and that private automobile use would be reduced by 50%, and all other transportation, planes, trains, trucks, and buses would be reduced by one-third. Oil prices would more than triple, and manufacturing outfits would be shut down again. And he goes on to say that factory workers would be laid off and transit workers and retail clerks. I don't have to go on with the scenario for all of you uh, people. So why do we continue to have such a dependence on, on Mideast oil when there's no reason geologically to do this, and there's no reason technologically to do it. We, ha As all of you know here, you're engineers and you're in the energy business, that we have more coal and uranium than the OPEC countries ever will have uh, oil. And I want to say right here, I'm not blaming the OPEC countries in my business today. They're customers <laughs> and, and also partners. And what I want to blame is our own uh, lack of foresight in becoming independent with our, with our use of, of our own resources. And why have we, we done this? Well, I don't know. We've had sort of what one guy called the energy paralysis of the energy business. We started out to, to get off of oil and gas and on the coal, and then something called acid rain surfaced. And my problem with acid rain is that Texas Utilities, my old company, has a power plant down in central Texas that we test for SO2 all the time, and the continuous chart rides against zero all the time until the pickup truck drives to change the chart. Then you get a spike in it. And so my problem with acid rain is it's like the guy that was looking 
over here on the street light one night looking for something, and the police came by and said, buddy, what you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my car keys. And so they got out and helped him look for a few minutes, and finally they said, well, well where did you lose them? He said, well, I lost them over there, but the light's over here, so this is where I'm looking. And that's about the problem with acid rain. My problem is if we rush into this bit, we'll spend billions of dollars trying to cure acid rain and still have it. So we ought to slow down at least and let Everett and some of these other people look at this to see just what ought to be done before we rush into to shutting coal down. And then the nuclear, as Bill has pointed out there, it's just, you know, what can I say about nuclear? It hasn't been said in the papers the last few days. But uh, I, I got a hold of this a testimony that Hans Beta did before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission a while back. And if you haven't got this, I'm just going to read a part of it. Get it and read the whole thing or put it in your file because you ought to have it. And he says that one reason that nuclear is in such bad shape, oh, I think he says three, he has three points here. It says, over the years, the NRC has acceded to small pressure groups and unduly proceduralized the regulatory process. This has contributed to bringing the further development of an otherwise promising and viable technology to a virtual standstill. Procedural and legalistic aspects of the regulatory process have expanded to the point where they overshadow and overpower substantive technical matters. And then two, he says, by the ways in which it has conducted its affairs, the NRC has contributed to the weakening of this nation's confidence in almost all aspects of the utilization and management of radioactive substances. The adversarial approach, barred from the law courts, simply is not relevant to the predictive responsibilities of science. Anytime you turn a technical thing over to the lawyers, you're going to get into trouble. If any lawyers in the room, I apologize, but I still believe that. <laughs> I even believe it of our own lawyers. And three, and Brown and Root's got more lawyers than Texas Utilities, if you didn't know it. <laughs> As a result, the NRC is currently suffering from a gradual erosion of the respect which it needs to successfully discharge its duties. And he goes on to say other things that you ought to read, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to propose them. But the, the main map of, of anti-nuclear people was put in the Wall Street Journal last Monday, uh, just a week ago today, it says the anti-nuclear age, and some of you read it, but I'm going to read part of it again, it said a few years back, Barry Commoner sat in our offices, the offices of the Wall Street Journal, and explained the anti-nuclear battle plan. He and others would sue in the courts and intervene at, reg intervene at regulatory hearings. They'd do anything possible to delay and delay and delay making nuclear energy uneconomical. You see, that, they're the greatest PR people in the world they made nuclear energy uneconomical and blamed it on you and me. I wish that this new CEA program would hire Barry Commoner because that's the kind of PRP we need. It goes on to say here, uh, nuclear power is complicated and, intim and intimidating and we sympathize with citizens who have legitimate worries about safety. But our most rapid environmentalists long ago began manipulating these fears to destroy the nuclear industry. It's true that they were aided by the mistakes of management and regulators, but that's hardly any consolation to the rest of us who will now have to pay the price for their success. So nuclear and coal are in jeopardy as a use in the United States, and I hope that a lot of Bill Gould's stuff works and all of us stuff. That's not all of Bill Gould's experiments work because he's doing a good job there. But I happen to be one that think that basically the base load of this nation still for some time to come is going to have to be in coal and nuclear. So our real crisis is in governance. How do we, how do we get a consensus of everybody? And I thought Dr. Gowan's talk today at lunch was very good because he was talking about the IEEE gave a chance for all engineers to sit down together and trade scientific knowledge and trade technical knowledge. But I believe today we need to be sitting down with more than just engineers and trading not only technical knowledge but coming to the philosopher. Some time ago, John Gardner, who was the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare for uh, President Johnson, wrote a book called Excellence. And I was glad to hear Dr. Gowan talk about excellence. But he said, 
In this book, he said, the free society is still the exceptional society. The ideal of a free society is still unattainable or unacceptable to most of the world's peoples. Many live under governments which have no inclination to foster freedom. Others are hemmed in by their own ignorance or by rigid social stratification. The foes of freedom are still ready to argue that the unruliness, sloth, and savage indulgence of men make a free society simply impractical. The world is full of people who believe that men need masters. If we're going to stay free in this country, we've got to sit down with more than just engineers and get some consensus. Uh, Gardner went on to say somewhere here, if I can find it, I'm trying to shorten an hour speech to 20 minutes, and I'm going to do it even though I just quit. <laughs> but <laughs> and I, that'll make you happy, won't it? <laughs> but somewhere in my notes here, I've got a quote from, from Gardner that says, a competent plumber is infinitely more admirable than an incompetent philosopher. And that a society that, uh, a society that shones excellence in plumbing because it is a humble activity and allows shoddiness in its philosophy because it is an exalted activity will be a society in which neither its plumbing nor its philosophy is any good. Neither its water pipes nor its theories will hold water. But, but my, my problem today is in getting a consensus is we've, the plumber has always needed the philosopher to make sure he pumped the right products. We might say that the drug trafficker might become an excellent plumber of his drugs. But you and, and I would say that this is not a socially accepted human endeavor. And that's what Gardner said before this, that a, that a society ought to demand excellence in all socially accepted human endeavors. And so this is what we're trying to do, I believe, as a nation, is decide just what is socially accepted human endeavor. And we engineers must broaden our circles to bring in the philosophers in order to get some consensus in this nation, or are we going to beat ourselves to death? In the words of James uh, Kilpatrick, the Washington correspondent, he said that we're going to get like the punch drunk Grosbeak. And he was writing one time in, in his home in West Virginia, and he said this little Grosbeak comes up and just punches his image in the window to, to death every day. But he says he's stubborn, and he's strong, so every day he comes back and punches it to death his image in the window. And he says we ought to make him the national bird, that we are, we are really punching ourselves to death in the window. So uh, what I want to say here now, though, is that we ought to do several things while we are trying to come to some consensus, in my opinion. One of the things that started us on this inflation tick before OPEC raised the price of oil was trying to produce guns and butter under President Johnson. And after that, Congress thought that they could throw money at anything. And now we've got such a horrendous deficit that everybody's trying to say that the, the deficit doesn't make, make any difference. And I've got lots of good friends who are, are economists, but I don't, believe a neither, either, I don't believe a single one of them knows a damn thing about what he's talking about. Uh, <laughs> I'm, Boy, I'm in trouble now. But, but I'm like Harry Truman. I've been looking for a one-armed economist because all they say is on the one hand this, you know, and on the other hand this. And if we only had one arm, we could, we could, uh, we could get it done. But the, the, there's several things we ought to do in this nation, in my opinion. And, and one is continue to work for a balanced budget. Even if, even if we had to raise taxes. And I'm all for Reagan, and I'm going to vote for Reagan, and I'm going, to, I'm going to work for Reagan and all like that, but I just wish he'd come off of some of his high horses and do something practical, because we can't stand this, this budget like that. And I think we ought to reincarnate Diogenes with his lantern looking for an honest man or a woman, because uh, my daughters are very women libs these days, and I had to put that in for their sake. In fact, one of them's got to... <laughs> One of them wears a T-shirt, and on the front of it it says, 
When God created man, she thought it was a joke. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, we need to reincarnate Diogenes and, and look for about 10 or 12 honest people and put them on a cabinet level commission. And I know we've had too many commissions, but do what Henry Ford II called a cabinet level planning, planning institution to set national goals to clear the fog in which we're all stumbling and get where are we going in this nation. We ought to, three, we ought to admit that our drastic dependence on foreign oil has affected not only our economy, but our foreign policy. Just last week, week before, there was an article in, the, in one of the Houston papers that said, uh, why is President Reagan gambling so much in Lebanon? And he's answered his own question, said, because he has to stay there in order to keep some stability in the Mideast, because if, if we and our allies lost the, lost the access to that Mideast oil, we'd world be in a hell of a shape. Then I think during this unofficial moratorium on nuclear power, we must design through EPRI or some other consortium, some standard design plant. And I'd like to preach a little bit now uh, because in a, in a paper that John Sawhill wrote about called, entitled Ethics and Energy for the Aspen Institute, he had these following things to say, and I think I can say them. The challenge of deciding the future of nuclear power is a responsibility we cannot ignore. As Walter Stace wrote, civilization lives in and through its upward struggle. Whoever despairs and gives up the struggle, whether it be an individual or a whole civilization, is already inwardly dead. Uh, I got my pages mixed up here. Herb, what did I do with page 24? <laughs> Y'all got to forgive me, but I'm really trying to hurry for your sake. It's the task of our generation to, to decide what technologies we will use, which directions we will head, and how we will order our lives to live in the years which encompass our lifetimes and those of our children. Indeed, a double-edged sword of good and evil has hung over human technology from the very beginning. As one philosopher wrote, the invention of knives and spears increased man's food supply, but it also improved the art of murder. The discovery, or, yeah, the discovery of nuclear energy now places all the earth under threat of destruction, yet it also offers the possibility of fusion power as an ultimate solution to man's energy problems. When mankind learned how to make use of fire some 50,000 years ago, it meant protection against predators and more and better food. It also meant that man could venture out of the tropics into colder climates. Do you suppose this did not bring about problems? When the fire went out in the cave on a winter night, and could not be relighted, there was a danger of freezing, or the smoke could ruin one's lungs. Why not give up fire then and move back to the tropics? Or one could not, he, he continues to say, extending his range, man increased his numbers. And so in increasing his numbers, when he went back to the tropics, he'd have an awful fight for the little bit of food supply left, and he'd find other people had moved into the tropics. If you ever want to read all this speech, I'll send it to you. <laughs> but I want to close by saying that some way or another, that was, a, that was a wonderful film that Dr. Jenkins had there. We made it 100 years, but we made it a lot further than that, you know. Some way or another, man has made it from the Garden of Eden to Dallas, Texas. <laughs> and some reason, way or another, with the utility people helping, we're going to make it from Dallas, Texas through the next hundred years. But I think the utility people now are about the old, like the old saying that some men are born great and some men achieve greatness and some men have greatness thrust upon them. Well, the utility industry is having greatness thrust upon us. And I think the utility industry must lead and must stand up and say the hard things, the hard decisions that this society must make today and we must get with competent philosophers and competent plumbers together, and we must find what is a socially accepted human endeavor. But I, I leave you with this message that sure, we made it from the Garden of Eden to Dallas, Texas, and we're going to make it on, but we made it because I'm just a fundamental foot washing Baptist. I love all the Catholics and Jews and everybody else, raise money for them and everything else, but I'm a foot washing Baptist. And in my opinion, when the Bible says that God created man in his own image, 
then that gave us the birthright, if God is a creator, that each one of us are creators in our own rights, and that what is going to get us, has gotten us from the Garden of Eden to Dallas, Texas, is going to get us from Dallas, Texas on in the future, is the creative mind of man. And we're going to go with this nation because we are free. But we've got to make some hard decisions, and the utility people's in the front of it, and I know everybody gets tired of beating your head. Sometimes I feel like Billy the Punch Drunk Grosbeak. But we've got to quit picking out an image in this nation and lead the people to the future. You're a great audience, and I'm sorry I've got to go, but my boss now says he wants to see me at 4.30. Thank you. Our next speaker now is Willis S. White, Jr., who is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the American Electric Power Company and its operating and other subsidiaries. Mr. White. Thank you very much, Herb. Like uh, those that uh, preceded me here to the podium, I too was impressed with the presentation that uh, Dr. Jenkins gave us earlier as we watched the history of the first hundred years of uh, this industry. I watched with some humility and I think some appreciation too of the good work that uh, so many of those who came ahead of us have done and have brought us uh, to this point. And also like Bill Gould, I think that uh, my own views on the future of the industry obviously are shaped by my experience uh, in our system. Our system is somewhat different than uh, Bill Gould's system. We in American Electric Power serve parts of some seven states in the Midwest. We are a system that uh, is powered by about 88 percent coal, about 10 percent nuclear, and 2% or perhaps a little more hydroelectric energy. Uh, we're a system that have experienced in the last uh, four or five years a rather severe recession of uh, the heavy industry that's in our area, is now beginning to recover, but has not yet fully recovered. We are, operate in seven states, which uh, provides uh, a challenge in itself because we deal with seven different regulatory authorities, eight really with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I, I assure you that uh, that presents some problems to us from time to time. But as I listened to Dr. Jenkins' presentation here today, I was also struck by the upbeat tone of the whole thing and of our whole history. It's one, I think, of optimism, and I think the electrical engineer is an optimistic person. And without that optimism that uh, we saw as we reviewed the early years of our industry, I'm not sure that the giants of our history would have been able to achieve the great accomplishments which we heard retold here this, this afternoon. With that optimism, we can meet the problems that we're going to have to deal with tomorrow. Frontiers that uh, may, uh, might stagger even the imag imagination of our predecessors. I'm a little bit like uh, Lou Austin. I think we're going to make it. Uh, we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us, but uh, we're going to make it. We'll have to have that unfailing optimism lest we fall prey to the ever-present dark and dreary collection of foreboding statistics which can all too easily produce negative forecast and a no progress or a status quo course of action. The doomsday syndrome, as one author put it. Now, I'm not talking about foolish optimism we have to come to terms with the real world as it is. And clearly today's set of facts does not justify unbounded optimism. But another word for optimism is faith. Faith in our ability to deal with the future. Faith that carries with it the necessary perseverance and patience 
which is so necessary to successfully dealing with the future. And that's the thing that I believe Lou Austin is talking about. We do have faith in the future of this industry and in this country. I'd like to illustrate uh, what I mean by listing some of the historic forecasts that I encountered as I was putting together these remarks. Appropriately, yeah, they come uh, here in Texas at any rate. These forecasts were made uh, about oil and gas supplies by the experts of their time. Here's what they said. In 1981, the United States Geological Survey, 19, 1891, I beg your pardon, the United States Geological Survey predicted that there was little chance of finding oil in Kansas or Texas. As we know now, that forecast was wrong by only 50 billion barrels. In 1914, the United States Bureau of Mines predicted that the total future national production of oil would be 5.7 billion barrels. That forecast to date has already been wrong by a factor of almost 25. In 1931, the Secretary of Interior said that the country's oil supply was running low, that we should start to import as much oil as possible. Since that time, more than 120 billion barrels of new oil have been discovered in the United States. And in 1956, there was a forecast that we had just about 150 billion barrels of oil left in the country. Since that time, more than 75 billion barrels have been produced, and it's estimated that there are as much as 200 billion barrels of crude oil yet to be recovered. I think you get the point. All of the forecasters, with the best of intentions, providing their very best projections about the future of this vital energy source, were wrong. As the late Herman Kahn pointed out in his book, the next 200 years, they were wrong. Hindsight is 2020 vision, and so before we go too much further in chuckling about these inaccurate forecasts concerning petroleum, we need to remind ourselves of how the events of the past 25 years have skewed the forecast in the electric utility industry. One needs only look back to 1964, just 20 years ago, to find the National Power Survey that forecasts a continuing decline in the cost of electricity in the years ahead. Just a little more than a year later, another event, described by Dr. Jenkins, turned the industry's direction 180 degrees. Almost everyone in the room recalls a power blackout along the East Coast, an event that aroused the nation to an awareness previously unmatched concerning the importance of reliable sources of electricity. On the day of the blackout, President Johnson wrote to Joe Swidler, then chairman of the Federal Power Commission, as follows, and I'd like to quote, Today's failure is a dramatic reminder of the importance of the uninterrupted flow of power to the health, safety, and well-being of our citizens and the defense of our country. This failure should be immediately and carefully investigated in order to prevent a recurrence. You are therefore directed to launch a thorough study of the cause of this failure. I'm putting at your disposal full resources of the federal government and directing the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Defense, and other agencies to support you in any way possible." Unquote. In a twinkling, the industry was told to change its priorities from price to reliability. Out of that investigation came the formation by the electric utility industry of nine regional reliability councils and in 1968 of the National Electric Reliability Council. These efforts made significant strides in helping ensure a reliable, continuous supply of electricity across the country. Thus, the unexpected event of 1965 produced effects which took several years to absorb, and we still feel them in the industry in our decisions today. Who among all of those looking at the future of this industry in the early 1960s could have forecast such an event and the ramifications of that event? In 1969, another event, 
put an indelible mark on the electric utility industry. In that year, passage of the National Environmental Policy Act committed our nation to considering the effect on the environment of any significant action by the federal government before such action is taken. The passage of NEPA was hailed at the time by just about everybody, including most of us in this industry, as simply an expression of our nation's dedication to the preservation of its environmental heritage. Who could have seen that this legislation, which seemed so right at the time, would become a tool to be used to slow down and indeed to stop a number of major power projects that in truth would have had minor effects on the natural environment. Let me cite just one example. Dr. Jenkins referred to the development of the 765 kV transmission on the American electric power system. In the latter half of the 60s, we decided to overlay our entire system with 765 kV network. It was essentially completed in the early 70s. Fortunately, it was completed at that time. I can tell you categorically that with the environmental regulations in effect today, it simply could not be built. NEPA was the beginning of many far-reaching programs of environmental controls that became significant factors in the swirling cost increase that blanketed the electric utility industry during the late 70s and the early 80s. And just as the industry was beginning to deal with the implications of NEPA in the early 70s, the 1973-74 oil embargo shot across the world scene, ripping apart the international and domestic economy and rewriting completely the economics of the energy business. Suddenly, electric utilities that had been paying four and five dollars a ton for coal found the price rocketing to 25, 30, and 40 dollars and more a ton. We hear a lot these days about so-called rate shock but believe me that in 1974, the shock of this fuel price increase reverberated throughout the industry and the regulatory process with very negative results for the industry. A totally frustrated public, fed up with sitting in long lines at gasoline stations, concluded that all the energy companies, including their local electric company, were hopping aboard some kind of profit-making machine. The facts were, of course, that the utilities were suffering badly because of they were unable to fully recover the skyrocketing cost of fuel on a timely basis, due primarily to the nature of the regulatory process. So rather than a profit bonanza for the utilities, the skyrocketing fuel prices were a financial nightmare. As these price increases filtered throughout the economy, inflation heated up even more. And by 1979, when the second embargo occurred, there was a new series of financial shockwaves throughout the economy, even before the full impact of the first embargo had been absorbed. One cannot leave the year 1979 without mentioning the other unanticipated event that has had a continuing deleterious effect on the electric utility industry. Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island is another example of the extent to which unexpected or unanticipated events redirect history and turn what appeared to be logically logical and sound forecast into just so much waste paper. But difficult though it is, we in the electric utility industry have a responsibility to pierce the veil of the future as best we can, knowing full well that unexpected events in the years ahead may very well skew terribly what we now truly believe to be solid forecast. Now having placed the proper number of qualifiers on the front end of my comments, let me turn now to what I see as the present state of the electric utility industry and how this present condition is influencing the years just ahead. That is the decade and a half that remain in this century and the years that go beyond that. Today's events, of course, are influenced by these happenings of the 70s and the early 80s, which I mentioned a moment ago. 
The two oil embargoes, the resulting inflation, accompanied by the historically high interest rates, which we've already heard about, regulatory lag, Three Mile Island, and the uncoupling of several energy sources from their historic relationship with the gross national product. All these factors influence where we stand at this particular moment in history. If I were to characterize the industry today, I would say it's in a tenuous state of transition. It has moved painfully from a provider of an essential service on a declining cost basis to a provider of an even more essential service. Just look at the proliferation of computational information processing, communication technologies throughout our society, all of them requiring electricity. We're providing an even more essential service today, but at costs that are rising. Our industry is now slowly overcoming the effects of regulatory lag and indifference. It's managed its affairs so that slowly earnings of some of the companies are once again approaching respectability, and it's carefully reaching out to determine just how all of this will affect the future. We can sense from whence we've come in this transition, but where we're heading is a little more difficult to determine. But we have to make the effort. In doing so, we need to avoid the trap of viewing the next 10 years and beyond as simply an extrapolation of our immediate past. In fact, the next decade should not be expected to become a continuation of the past decade, any more than the 50s and 60s should have been assumed to continue into the 70s and 80s. In the late 60s, we made the mistake of expecting that 7 to 8 percent annual rate of growth in electric energy use would continue throughout the 70s and 80s. In turn, we shouldn't make the mistake today of assuming that the low growth rate experienced during the last decade necessarily will continue through the next. It may do so, but we'd be wise not to put all of our eggs in that one basket. How are we then to approach a look in the future of the electric power industry? As a first step, we might take the broadest possible look at the current state and future prospects of our industry's product, electricity. Between 1973 and 1982, the total use of all energy dropped 5 percent, and the use of non-electric forms of energy dropped 15 percent. For electricity, the story is different. The use of electric power was 20 percent higher in 1982 than it was in 1973. I use 1982 figures because they're the latest ones available. 1983 figures would present a more dra dramatic picture. This trend is reflected in each of the major categories of electric energy use. During the past 10 years, the residential use of electricity increased an average of 3 percent a year, while the residential use of all other forms of energy declined by 2 percent a year. In the commercial sector, the use of electricity has grown by 1.25 percent a year during the past decade, while the use of other forms of energy in this sector has dropped about 1 percent a year. The picture is even more dramatic when we turn to the industrial sector. Despite the emphasis on energy conservation, or perhaps because of it, and despite the recession from which we have only recently emerged, America's industries continue to step up their use of electric power. The use of non-electric energy in the industrial sector has dropped 27 percent since 1973, but the use of electric power has increased by more than 8 percent. Now, this occurred because industry's programs to improve productivity and to conserve energy often involve additional electrification. This country's industry is just beginning now to go through a process of major change in an effort to increase its competitiveness at home and abroad by increasing its productivity and efficiency. Such programs almost invariably involve additional electrification. The application of electric arc furnaces, of induction heating processes, of industrial heat pumps, lasers, robotics, and other advanced technologies all require extensive use of electricity. 
So it is that the unique importance of electricity is not simply that it has provided a growing amount of energy for our home stores, our offices, and industries. It is now, as it has been, an indispensable ingredient to the health of our economy. It is indeed the energy lifeblood of our society. One fact I think emerges from this discussion. Electric power use appears to continue being linked to our gross national product. Through the years, that relationship has been certain and steady. The aberrations of recent years may have shaken the relationship, but a study of the figures over a period of time will show that while the equation relating these two variables may have changed, the relationship remains. Thus, while the gross national product was growing 18% during the past decade, our use of electricity rose 20%. In 1982, when the use of electricity declined, the GNP declined. A major reason why electricity and the GNP have maintained this relationship during the past 10 years can be found by looking at the behavior of the price of electricity in real terms and comparing that price with the price of oil and natural gas. During the past 10 years, the real price of electricity has increased 60%. During the same period, the real price of oil increased by about 350%, and the real price of natural gas increased by more than 250%. If the price advantage of electricity versus oil and natural gas its two major competitors in the energy market continues for some time to come, and I think there's a number of reasons to believe that this will be the case. Electric energy is bound to make further inroads into the markets of its competitors, and this was pointed out by Bill Gould when he pointed out that as time goes on, a greater portion of our energy use will be in the form of electricity. Thus, as the GNP continues to grow in real terms, there's bound to be a greater demand for electricity. If this demand increases in an average annual rate of 2.5%, which is a modest enough figure, by the year 2000, we'll be using 50% more electric power than we are today. A faster rate of growth would, of course, result in an even greater increase in the power requirements. Where will it all come from? 